All right, hello and welcome to the Eng Hiring Podcast. This is episode three. Uh, I'm Sharia. And hey, I'm Rich. Cool, thanks for joining us today, Rich. Um, there's, of course, a lot of stuff to talk about when it comes to hiring new engineers. Um, one of the hardest things that we've covered in previous episodes is that there is sort of this pipeline, right? Um, there's, the, there's the recruiting pipeline, there's the, sorry, there's the um, even just fielding pipeline, getting people to know about your company. And then there's getting people uh, to actually apply. And then there's the interview pipeline and then the actual people who get accepted in the onboarding pipeline. And during that whole thing, you're kind of trying to communicate to the candidate, you know, what it's like to work at the company. And, uh, you know, when, when I think about it, the, the, biggest, um, the biggest draw that many companies have is whatever product that they last released, right? Then, and that's, you know, people assume based off of that product, oh, it'd be awesome to work for that company. You know, like Tesla just made a car. Um, mm -hmm. I want to work on a car. So as you and I both know, having been in the industry for a while, there can be a huge gap between what the, the product that actually gets out there and what it's like to work on that product. Right. Um, how do how does a hiring manager communicate this, or maybe even more importantly, when does a hiring manager communicate this? Yeah. So I think that um, you're touching on a couple of different things, which is like, hey, how do we talk about what the work of the job is, but then also like, how do we sort of tie in this work to the mission of the company and even the yeah. company brand, like when you mm -hmm. talk about stuff like Tesla and like not everybody is fortunate enough to have like, hey, our mission is to like electrify the world's vehicles or whatever the Tesla mission is, that's attractive. But everybody has a story that is uh, compelling and attractive to people. So you don't have to like, oh, I'm not Tesla, so I can't do this. Like you can tell that story and you should tell that story at, at every stage in the hiring process. And I think, you know, we're going to come back to this probably again and again, but I always think about this as like starting from the right foot. I think a lot of times uh, managers, they have to hire, they're feeling, oh no, I got to grow my team. And so they sort of rush to get a job wreck out there and they don't really think through what is the mission of the role. And I think that that's a mistake because you end up focusing on other things. Like we talked about, like maybe it's skills, maybe it's you know, if it's bad, like years of experience and things like this. And then you get people that sort of look like vaguely what you're looking for. So say you're looking for software engineers, you get sort of vaguely maybe senior software engineers, but when maybe you hire them, they're like, oh, I just, I kind of realized that this, this person isn't the right person to do the, this mission. So like, mm. let's figure out like, what is, what is the mission of this role? Yeah. Actually, before we get into that, there's something interesting you said too, which is that uh, you get somebody who looks like they belong to the role, and like, and that looks like is important because what you're looking at throughout the throughout the hiring process is, you know, for one resume, um, and and resume can be can be a lot of things, you know. Like, I think we'll probably have a whole set of episodes on on how to look at resumes um, or what we do wrong when we look at resumes. Um, but then there's the like interview. Uh, uh, feedback itself, and you can say, "Ah, yes, this person looks like this other person on the team." Um, so I wonder if they should be kind of both going at it together, um, right? Uh, so that I think there's there's something very fascinating, and I've done this before too, of like uh, classifying engineers together and saying, "Aha, see, both of them are that type." So let's 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 put them onto that that role, um, if that makes sense. Um, yeah, absolutely. I think I meant, might have mentioned to you earlier, we were saying like a lot of times we think about this, we're like, hey, we have our excellent engineer and we'll call her Alice. And we're like, we just need to clone Alice, right? And so when we think about cloning her, we actually think about only her like sort of externalizable attributes mm -hmm. that she's a senior software engineer and she's really good at Python and she's, uh, you know, uh, excellent communicator and, and things like this. And all those things are good and they should be built into the, the, the job spec and the job description, et cetera, because you want to build on what works for your team and your culture, but also realize like, unless these people are doing exactly sort of the same work and exactly the sort of um, same thing, uh, they probably are going to have different missions and you should probably still do the mission definition anyway, because this is a good way to get people excited about the work that you're going to be doing and a way to differentiate your job post or your recruiter outreach from the thousands of other types of outreach that these folks are going to get, right? Yeah. 
So I, I like that term, mission definition, as opposed to job description. That's so, right. Yeah, yeah. What are you hiring this person to do? Right. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the military has this concept called mission command, which is where a lot of this comes from. And like, you know, I, I wasn't in the military, but my, you know, you have like sort of a, a I call like a GI Joe's version of the military where there's, it's like top down, like a lot of orders. In reality, it's not like this. They, the commands, they talk about like, here's what I want to have. Here's the outcome I want to have happen and why I want that outcome to happen. And the reason that they moved to this model was because they knew that the situation on the ground in, in a conflict is um, so fluid that centralized command can't possibly know like all of the sort of things that are happening. So they said, okay, well, if we empower the people on the ground to know what the context is, they'll figure out a way to fulfill this mission without us having to like, you know, specify an exact detail how it's going to get done. They're going to, they're going to be able to improvise. Right. Yeah. And so I think take that concept and take it to the, this position that you're hiring for and say, Hey, in 90 days, what do we want to be true? What, what, what will this person either do or contribute or like, like how will we know that this person was a, a great hire? And just even asking these questions breaks you out of this like, oh, you know, has to have four years in C++ and does algorithms, has to be a good teammate. All of a sudden we're like, oh, this is actually the meat and potatoes of why we are opening this role. And guess what? If you do this work, when this person, you find this person and they start, you hand them this piece of paper on your first day and go, hey, this is how you're going to be evaluated in the next 90 days, right? Like you already mm -hmm. have their like objectives. Awesome. Super empowering. People know what's to, what to expect from them. I know you just changed jobs, right? And so it can be hard to understand like, hey, like, what, like, you know, how am I going to be measured? Like, what, you know, I, yeah. I know that, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm excited to be here, but like, what's really like the mission? Doing this pre-work really helps like sort of get you um thinking about who the right person is but then also setting them up for success and onboarding which again another huge topic yeah i so there ooh, i feel like we've touched on like the um this really like rich fertile ground of uh of topics because um what i also see from that 90-day mission definition type of thing is the setup for a longer term career and um and that's something which uh in my parents generation it felt like there was much more talk about like how each individual job would help you in your career. Mm -hmm. um, and somehow in, at least in the tech field, I don't see that as much. I don't see, uh, at least I personally have not seen uh, job postings or even like discussions during the interview about how working in this particular role at this particular company will help in, their, in your career because, because of whatever reason, right? Like conversations aren't framed in that way. Um, and, and the, and maybe this is actually a, we're encouraging people to go have that, the first step towards conversations like that, which is, by the way, if you sign up for this job, 90 days after you start, this is what we expect from you, right? This is what we want you to drive. Um, and, and that, I feel like just having that conversation is really healthy. Right. And absolutely. Yeah. And I just want to say, like, you're not alone. I think that it's almost a taboo subject. And I think that it, I don't know where it comes from, but I can remember some um, uh, sort of new grad engineers that were on my team and then they were there for a year. And, and then they said, oh, we're, we're, they left to do a startup and I was talking to them and they said, well, this was like our plan the whole time, but we were scared to tell you and we were advised not to tell you because maybe you wouldn't hire us if you knew that we only, we were trying to come to a bigger company and get this experience and then go out. I said, well, I can sort of understand like maybe that that mindset exists, but I think like you think it's much better to talk about, Hey, you're going to come here and you're going to do some work. Maybe it's, maybe it's going to, we're going to, the position is going to grow and you're going to fall in love with the people in the team and what we're doing. And you're going to be here for a long time. Maybe not, but you're going to learn these things, have this impact, et cetera. And so when it is time for you to move on, this is going to be a, a logical extension to this. And I think that, people hiring is tough. And so hiring managers, I get it. They sort of want to like get these people and sort of Stockholm syndrome them and like hold them forever. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but the reality is that's not, that's not how people's careers are anymore. It's much more episodic, right? Like we do yeah. something for a little, a little bit of time and then we do um, something else. And as a manager, you should be thinking about what is this person's goals and will their goals do, can I provide for these goals? Right. Can I provide the events for the run or can I set them up to fly somewhere else, right? Like mm -hmm. that's, that's okay, right? You're not being, 
a bad manager by thinking that way. Yeah. Yeah. And what, what I enjoy about that too is uh, then that sort of makes you as a hiring manager, like inclined to play the long game or rather uh, I think we, we should encourage people if they're hiring managers to play the long game. Like you're going to have a career that's 30, 40 years long as an engineering manager. If you know, and, and so during that time, wouldn't it be nice if every two years, everyone you hire during those two years has good things to say about you and feels like they got done what they wanted to get done. Um, and then and then they remembered you so that when you go do the next thing, they call you up and say, hey, uh, I'd love to work with you again, right? Yeah. Um, and I feel like this mission definition thing is really a, a solid way to get towards that. Yeah, and I think that it is though, I wanna tell you that I, I talk to people about this, people get very excited about it and then they don't do it. And I, and I, <laughs> and I love things like this because um, yeah, it sort of underlines like why these things are so hard because there's a fundamental tension when you think about the work and you're like, say you're hiring this, like when you have to hire like a leader or you have to hire some like principal person, it's very clear like, hey, this, you know, you need to build an engineering team. You need to do this. These are bigger goals. If you're hiring like the sixth software engineer onto a team that has an established product, et cetera, you have to really sort of dig and go like, hey, like what are the meaningful things that we're going to, you know, uh, measure uh, for this person, but they're achievable. And the reason I know that they're achievable is because most companies, especially if you're getting to that scale, do performance reviews mm -hmm. and they have a career ladder. And like all of these things are a nexus. They should all be connected together so that the objectives that you hire this person for and the mission you hire them for is directly re reflected in their, you know, 90 day evaluation, in their performance review and in their, yeah. in the ladder for their, excuse me, advancement. And I think that that's the level of crispness, crispness, excuse me, that uh, you want to get to. You don't want to be in the situation where it's like, contribute like you some of you read some bad job descriptions and it's like contribute to code review and like or like you know uh these sort of very vague um kind of things and the way to escape vagueness i think people get trapped in this all the time the way that to uh escape vagueness is to ask the question so so what or so that so it's like do this thing so that x okay throw away the first thing and just say the so that like hey we gotta ship FizzBuzz 2.0. So like literally in, in 90 days, we're going to ask everybody, did, you know, new Alice 2.0, did you, did you meaningfully contribute to this in the following ways? And that's like going to be the evaluation. And I, and I think that that is like sort of really motivating because it tells the person external that's considering joining here, like, okay, like I'm, I'm coming on. They're not going to jerk me around. I'm going to be set up to work on the main thing we can understand like all the dimensions of that product i can get excited about the impact that i'm going to have i understand the rules of the game how i'm going to be measured right this is all like like real um uh gold stuff and when you do it i promise you like it's tough it's bumpy to to set it up um but then you're you're gonna the the reward is like so great that you're like why didn't i do this the whole time why was i why was i interviewing people and just like asking them about like skills and expertise and like what they liked about their last job. Like, why don't we just talk about, here's the work that we need to, to get done. And I haven't even yeah. talked about like the negative selection pressure. Like there are going to plenty of people are going to look at your mission and the, the things and go like, Oh, not for me. Right. I'm, yep. I'm going to go out the door. And that's great. It's going to save you so much time. Yeah. So I, um, I love the term that I, about that you use the nexus, right? So there's, there's some things in any company where like, if you start optimizing for this one thing, it has like, it kind of back propagates to other parts of the business and it forces you to really be explicit about other things. And so if you, I think mission definition in, uh, in a job posting is one of those things where if you say we need this person because we need them to drive these five new merchant integrations, right? And you say that then a product manager in charge of merchant integrations might come along and say, yes, that's true. Or we don't need five merchant integrations. Who said that, right? And then like, it becomes this great sanity check for within your organization. Um, and, and there's different ways where then, you know, you have sort of this uh, accountability across the organization to say, okay, um, in performance review, this person launched five merchant integrations. That's great. We, uh, you know, that's a lot of integrations, woohoo. And then the product manager would say, but we didn't need those, you know, like, or, or, or whatever, like to like 
to have that happen at the performance review stage is really bad, right? Really bad, yeah. Um, so you want to, pre to prevent that type of thing, you can, you basically need to make sure that your job posting has a, has that kind of um, clear product deliverable, uh, like uh, not even feeling, but pre clear product deliverable link, right? right? And and that helps sort of the whole organization get together, which is, I think, um, exciting to me because one of my fundamental hypotheses is that uh, hiring and the health of your hiring process is downstream of the rest of your organization. Um, and and but but like if you make changes here, it can actually kind of propagate back upstream. Right. Um, and, and so but one quick way to know about the health of your organization and the priorities of your organization is your is your hiring. Right. Um, and so that so I, I love that that term, the nexus. Right. That it's like yeah. this becomes this thing. The thing I was thinking of when you were talking about this is like, hey, you're creating organizational clarity right around mm -hmm. uh, the purpose, around why these recs exist. I think there are companies that I really admire that do even at the top level, if like you have to open a, a job requisition, you have to say like, hey, here's why we're opening this and here's the expected business impact. And, mm -hmm. they, and, they, and they keep track. And so they like, if you say like, hey, if you give me uh, a whole new team of engineers, PMs and designers and, and a year, my expected impact is X, right? And like, these are bets. And so maybe you don't, you don't make that or whatever, but they're actually keeping track of like what the, the reason that these folks are, um, being added and what the mission is, et cetera. I think a lot of times when you I, I work with companies that sort of hit this hyperscale, hyper growth perspective, they quickly get into this mindset of like, well, engineers in particular are a scarce resource. Uh, we just, we, we have a lot to do. We just gotta like hire them. We have to hire a lot of them. And that's yeah. a big trap, right? Yeah. So yeah, and, and that's like, uh, yeah, I, I want to rant about the fungibility of engineers, right? Like, or, <laughs> sorry, the assumed fungibility of engineers yes. when really that, it's like, that's not the case. Like there's so many instances where I've taken over other people's work and I'm like looking around just sort of like, what, how did they do this? You know, um, and, and it would take, it'll take me months to ramp up on, to get to the same level of productivity that they're doing. And this is somebody who's on the same team as me, who, you know, technically counts as just another employee the same way I do. But there are real arbitrages in getting the like correctly motivated person onto the to the right job, right? Um, Absolutely. And and that's I think, yeah, I think basically defining this um, this mission ahead of time, uh, like you said, it selects out the people who are like, yep, that's not for me, and it'll naturally draw on the people who are just going to do a better job of it because they care about that and they're interested in that. Yep. And I think that when people leave your organization, like I talk to a lot of people who are changing jobs as part of my work and a, a frequent refrain is like, Hey, especially for people that have been there maybe a year, maybe a year and a half. And I say, okay, well, you know, tell me like you, you joined there not too long ago and you did some stuff and then it didn't work out. And they say, yeah, you know what happened is I thought I was being hired to do X and then the situation on the ground was Y. This happens for not like bad reasons. Sometimes like there's misunderstanding. Sometimes the company has to change direction, et cetera. But I think that um, really, if I really unpack that with that hiring manager and that person, what happened was someone was like, we need an engineer to work on vague stuff. And then they sort of were like, hey, here are all the things that we kind of do at this company. And then they sort of constructed a fairy tale together, right? Mm -hmm. You know, and then they got there and like, oh, the real thing is, you know, this thing that I'm not actually interested in. Whereas if you took a beat and said like, hey, actually, for the next 90 days, like this is really what the impact is, et cetera. And I'm focused on the next 90 days here because I really feel like that's the amount of time that people need to ramp up, right? Mm -hmm. But also um, to, to make an impact. And I also feel like it's um, a period of time that's like quantifiable. Like I, you know, like asking like, um, oh, you know, uh, to set like two year goals and things like that. First of all, isn't realistic for the type of startups and companies I work with, but in general, I don't think it's realistic in, in the kind of uh, environments that we're in. 100%. But I do get I do get this pushback that is related to what you're saying, which is the assumed fungibility of engineers. They said, well, I don't want to do mission-based hiring because we're growing and I need an engineer that is just a generalist and I can just like plug them in to anything. And it's like, I understand where you're, where you're coming from. And I understand the need to like not pigeonhole 
yourself. And I definitely think when I interview people, I try to understand how adaptable they are and how much, you know, like how much of a, a sometimes people call it like a T-shaped person, right? That they are, which is like an IDEO um, concept. But um, I think that when you sort of are looking for cookie cutter engineers, you are um, at risk of basically uh, being sort of like, like this in your engineering organization. You have, you have sort of people that can work on everything, but they're like, not necessarily, they're maybe they're working on everything you give them at 70%, let's mm -hmm. just say to make up the number. Whereas mm -hmm. if you had people that were like, oh, I'm really engaged with this mission, I'm doing this, maybe they're gonna do that at 90, 99%, right? And like, yeah. oh no, like the business changed and they can't, they, they, you don't have a spot for them. That's unfortunate, but what's more important is that the people that um, you're hiring are uh, creating high impact for themselves and higher impact for the team and the company, et cetera. And so I try to steer people away from this idea that like you can just like get these sort of generalist uh, uh, folks and then scale your organization this way. I try to make, I try to um, lean hard into um, the mission uh, side yeah. of things. Yeah, I, um, you know, there's, there's sort of a aphorism, I guess, uh, people in hell want ice water, right? Um, <laughs> Which is like, oh yes, of course, like we get it. You're you have a lot of problems, so of course you want somebody who's going to fix all of those problems. Of course you right. do, right? Um, but that doesn't, um, for one, that doesn't come without a cost, right? Like there is, like even even generalists, as you said, like you might think you might think, oh yeah, they're all you know. Look at it. this person can crack every problem that's thrown at them, um, but they're paying a huge cost as they do so, right? There's there's context switching and all of that, and they that that individual engineer might also be paying a career cost. Because again, if you don't have that clear mission, that like 90 day mission of I'm going to deliver this thing, um, it's really hard to talk about what you did. You know, you then you just become the person who's like, yeah, I just, I clean up messes as they happen. Um, right, and we all and, know, we've all worked with people who are like that, right? Yeah, like, yeah and some yeah. of us have been that person. Right, right? right. Uh, and, and, yeah. and that doesn't necessarily lead to much happiness either. Um, so the, so I think that it, it comes back like, you know, Doing this, doing this one, this one simple trick, um, of, uh, <laughs> you know, of, of doing this, uh, defining the mission for the person that you want to hire, it creates alignment across your organization, right? right? It's it's a clear and loud signal to a bunch of people who really shouldn't be in that role and who'd be disappointed in that role um, uh, to go to go find something else to do, and it brings the people in who do want to do that. Um, and the, the the last part, which I'm hearing from you, which I think we haven't talked about yet, is the is how maybe we need to destigmatize people leaving, you know, mm. um, that there is maybe just a, you know, people do change jobs and that should be something that um, should be treated as a as sort of a dignified victory. And maybe that comes out of having like a bunch of quarters, right? 90 day periods where this person actually did what they wanted and got exactly what they wanted. And then, well, now there's nothing more for them to do here. They're going to go on and do whatever else uh, because they've defined their own mission in whatever way they wanted, right? That's right. And I think that, you know, you have to get to a certain place as a leader uh, from a confidence perspective, also like feeling like you're good at hiring and you're good at team building and things like this to de-risk the idea of like, I got this person, like if they leave, that's gonna be sad. But if, as long as, as they're leaving for reasons that are good for them, I'm gonna be able to find and hire somebody and we're leaving on good terms um, and so on and so forth. I do think that, um, most people I talk to are sort of they're they you know they're not bad leaders they're 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 good but they're just like hey they have a lot of anxiety about you know someone comes to me and says like hey I think I'm you know uh, thinking about leaving because I've gotten all of these uh, objectives um, done I think my approach is to sit down and say like okay like that's that's good like let's work together and try to figure out like what do you want to do next and then mm -hmm. it's my job as a leader, especially in a larger organization to go out and like find this person a home in that organization. Cause we're trying to retain them in, in that organization. And so like, hey, if this person's goals look like X, Y, and Z, I'm gonna work my network. I'm gonna talk to HR. I'm gonna talk to other leaders of the company. I'm gonna say like, hey, we have this person and they're killing it, right? And they're doing a great job and it's time for them to go somewhere else. Like where can we put them for like that have challenges that look like X, Y, and Z. And that's like, that's your, your job as a leader. And then ultimately, if you can't do that and they have to go and get that challenge met outside of the organization, then that's going to be okay. I will say though, the other caveat that happens, uh, I always give this example. Um, 
you know, a senior software engineer comes to me and says like, hey, I've reached it. I've, the, this is the Mount Everest, the pinnacle of my career. I've done everything I need to do. I've learned everything I need to do. I'm, I'm, I'm tapped out and I think I'm gonna, you know, take a couple months off and travel the world and then I'm gonna go work somewhere else. I said, cool. And I respect that. Mm -hmm. Will you do me a favor, given that you're giving me a ton of notice, which I really appreciate. We've got a person who's been working with you that's a little more junior, not super junior, but a little more junior. Will you just pair with them from now until, you know, a month from now or whenever you're going to go and just like try to teach them everything you know so that the mission and everything great things that we built have continued and they're like oh of course yeah that sounds it sounds so great and then i don't hear anything for a month or so mm -hmm. i check in i say hey you know like what's going on with uh you know job shop search and 90 percent of the time someone says to me well i thought i knew everything and then i tried to teach it to this other person so i could leave and then i realized I don't know anything. Mm -hmm. And now I'm super engaged in this work. And this to me is like the transition for technical, technical people from like technical lead to technical leadership, where they realize, oh, actually, my new mission is like to try to like take what I know and like like lead other people. And that's like yeah. these people like sort of go from like, I gotta walk out of here. And they probably go to a lateral move where they would do the same thing and they just sort of stay at this level. Yeah. They go and they through the act of actually trying to like communicate this to another person that's a little bit behind them in, in the journey, they open up this whole other area of possibility. And so I think that, I mean, that's great because I get to retain them and I get to keep working with them. But I also to tell you as like a hiring manager, like that's the kind of, these are the kind of situations you should be trying to create. And you're only gonna create them if you are confident enough to accept the fact that like these people are on their own journey, you don't control them, but yeah. what you can do is to provide them insight, guidance, resources, so that they can go and have these different experiences. And it might work out and, and it might not. I could, I could tell you just as easily, that's an inspirational story. I could tell you just as easily how much of times it didn't work out too. So I don't wanna, it's not, it's not all beard skittles, right? But uh, it, is, it, is, it is something where I think the job of the leader is to sort of create these contexts. 100%, and I think that's the right way to try to retain people, right? right. It's like to show them um, or to have them show themselves that there's actually a lot more potential for growth, that there's a lot more missions out there for them. Right? That's right. Um, so I thank you. That was, a, that was a beautiful way to kind of summarize um, like what it means for me to be a leader as well, right? To really offer people, like to just basically like light a path, not mm -hmm. necessarily push people down it or like whatever, just say like, hey, you know, there might be another path there. Um, and, and that's also, I think what we're looking for when we look at new job descriptions, right? We're looking for like, oh, what is this path? Um, right. and that's what I would love to see everyone kind of put into their job descriptions a bit more, just like, what Absolutely. does it mean to walk down yeah. this way? Exactly. Yeah. And I think that the more, less is more too. I think like, um, you, uh, want to, I think having good copywriting can help when we make it concrete, like how are we going to communicate this? But also like when you talk to these folks, you remember you're assessing them for your team, but you're also selling this position. So really tell them like, hey, like this is what it means. This is like what it means for me to work here. This is why I choose to work here. This is what the opportunity I think looks like. And I think for the right type of person, these are the kind of things that we can do together. And those candidates are going to fill that space with their enthusiasm, their insight, et cetera. And so, yeah, it'll be a much better match. Conversations are like this or why I do this podcast. So thank you, Rich. Thank you. <laughs> thank for this. you. It's great. All right. Um, See you all, all next right. time. Yeah. Bye. Bye.